Greetings hobbyists, this is Arsans of Vool, and in this video we're going to be having a look at why I don't use plasticity. So this has come up a few times in recent videos where I've had people in the comments section saying, well, why didn't you just do this in plasticity? You could do this in plasticity and it would be quicker, which in some instances has been true and actually more often not, it's been not true. But either way, I thought it'd be good to cover why I'm not using plasticity, even though I'm more than happy to use things outside of Blender and then bring them into Blender if it improves my workflow. Now, before we get into this, this is not going to be a video of me slagging off plasticity. I think it's a really good bit of software. So if that's what you've come for or you've come to heroically defend plasticity then feel free to do so but that's not what this video is going to be and hopefully this will lead to some interesting discussions in the comments section so if you think I've got anything wrong please do watch the video and say in the comments section I'm more than happy to take things on board and I'm definitely not an expert in this bit of software. So plasticity is a NURBS modeling piece of CAD software, which means that effectively it uses mathematical equations to calculate the shapes and the interactions between the different shapes that you can see on screen. It also means that it's got the massive benefit that you can fillet objects really easily, which effectively means to bevel them or to bevel between different objects. And what's so good about it being mathematically generated is that you can change things really easily in a way that you just never will be able to do in something like Blender, which works off mesh. And you can see how powerful this is with how the fillets transition between the different objects and the things that you can do with those objects as you move them around and it automatically calculates everything that you need. The other thing that's probably worth mentioning at this point as well is that when you actually set up plasticity, you also can choose the controls that you use for it. And it has settings for things like Blender. So it will emulate the standard Blender settings that you might be used to if you've used Blender before. A really nice feature there that really shows they've thought about what they're doing here and making this as user-friendly as possible. And it also means you can transition between softwares really easily if you want to do something on one program and then move over the other by exporting it to the other one. Finally, and while this is not available yet, the creators put in place some bridging software or is going to be putting in place some bridging software that's going to allow this to work between plasticity and blender in real time so that you can change things in plasticity and then it will change it in blender as well so you can do things like your texturing in blender if you're interested in this for cg work but it will automatically apply those changes in blender with the texturing that you've got applied so something potentially really powerful if you want to use those both together for CG work. So all in all, a fantastic tool set, an easy to use interface, and a lot of power in the things that you're able to do, especially in terms of that mathematical modeling fillets, and also being able to Boolean or extrude quite effectively. And you can see the sort of objects you can create in this video from Pixel Fondue, and how quickly you can go about doing it. Now that's just some of the features, but the question kind of remains then, why am I not using this? because it seems like the sort of thing that I would really enjoy. And to be fair, I've watched a lot of videos on this at this point, especially those by Pixel Fondue, and I really enjoy the way this program works. So what's my issue? Well, let's go through these in order, and these are in importance order to me, but they might be totally different to you, and these might be things that might not matter to you in the slightest. Now the first one, and this is for me the biggest, is that you model in a destructive way in plasticity. Whereas here you can see me working in Blender, and I'm applying a difference boolean and this has been done in a non-destructive way meaning we have a modifier panel and if I come over to that I can still change things around and I can do this at any point I could go and work on a range of different things and then come back to this and still change it scale it up make it smaller move it around whatever I want to do whereas in plasticity you'd effectively have to delete the object out and start again or undo all the way back to this and this works in other areas as well for example you can array in plasticity and do things like radial arrays and to be fair the radial arrays especially are a little bit easier to do in standard plasticity than it is in plain blender without any add-ons and while that's great if you want something that's relatively easy to follow if you want to have more control and come back and edit things later this becomes quite tricky. The other thing that you can start to see when you go into the program is that it is a relatively new program. For example, if we look at raying in plasticity, then you have one way of doing this radial array. And by that, I mean, it's got one set of units. You can transform it in terms of a set distance. Whereas if we take Blender and an array here, we can do this by a distance, for example, in millimeters, which is the same in plasticity. But we also have a relative component as well, where we could set this to be a relative two offset, which is going to mean that it's two widths away from the original, leaving a perfect gap of one width in between. 
And to do that, I don't need to know or have remembered or go and measure again the width of this cube. And this slight lack of fine control and ability to come back and edit later extends to things like radial arrays, where, again, it's very nice and easy to set up in plasticity, but once you've done it, you've done it, and you don't have as much control over things, whereas in Blender, you can still fiddle around with things like the iterations and how far away it is from your center point even after you've done it and you're coming back to it later. Which for someone that does sort of sketching in Blender and then modifies after I've tried things out a little bit, for me this is a really, really big deal. So this destructive workflow that plasticity has is a bit of a deal breaker for me. But my next thought was this isn't necessarily the end of the world. If I can create some objects in plasticity and then import them into Blender, then I can solve this problem that way. I can use plasticity for the bits like filleting that Blender's not gonna be as good at. And then luckily there's an export option, which means you can bring it in as an OBJ. And what's really cool about this is you can change it to tries, quads or engons, and you can fiddle around with the density of this, which means you can make it more or less detail heavy. Now, this seems like a great thing, but I was a little bit surprised to find out when I looked at this that actually the density of this, even at its highest amount, isn't actually as high as I'd normally go if I was creating something in Blender for 3D printing. Now, don't get me wrong, this is perfectly fine for if you're doing CG work, but it is just is not enough for giving a smooth 3D print. So again, a bit of an issue, and hopefully at some point they'll change this so you can actually make this more dense, because bear in mind that this is being generated mathematically, you should be able to go way denser than you can in Blender. Then this issue gets a little compounded further when you start realizing that some of the other settings that you might want to use when bringing this into Blender especially the Engon setting, has issues of its own. For example, plasticity seems to be able to deal with the fact that you've got Engons where they don't necessarily line up when you've got curves. But if we have a bit of a closer look at this object, we can see that these faces, or more specifically, the edges that make up these faces on some of these cylinders don't line up perfectly. And that's going to cause not only issues in Blender and a lot of cleanup that's gonna take a lot of time, which is sort of taking away the point of using plasticity if it's gonna take longer to use in the long run, but also if you were to bring this into a 3D printing program, it is not going to like this and it's gonna note this down as errors and potentially give you a mesh that's not gonna print or it's gonna try and clean it up itself, which is gonna potentially cause problems in the way that this is going to align these points. The last thing that needs mentioning is the price. And let's start with the fact that you get a 30 day free trial to give plasticity a go. And if you are interested in it, do, as I say, check out some of the videos that are linked into the description and do try that 30 day free trial. Because let's face it, Blender can be a bit of a pain to learn. It's great because it's so powerful, but there's just a lot to it. And I appreciate that that can be quite intimidating. Whereas this is definitely gonna be a level up over certain things that people use when they start out, such as 3D Builder or other shape-based tools so definitely worth trying but if you do want to carry on using this you are going to be paying for it and it does have a minimum payment of $99. Now that is a bargain compared to certain other 3D modeling tools like Fusion 360 which I've got the price up for here and there's no denying there is a lot of work that has gone into this product. It's got a lot of potential for the future and I think it's gonna be really, really good. I can see a lot of people using it, and I know a lot of people already are, and there's good reason for that. But, and this is very personal, as a teacher, I do see a lot of people that aren't going to be able to afford this straight away. And I have a lot of students whose families just aren't in the financial situation where they could put down $100 on something like this. Whereas something like Blender that is free does have paid for add-ons, but you don't need them straight away. You might not need them at all. And it can be made up of lots of smaller purchases. And when I look at a price of $99 and think about the amount of add-ons I could purchase for Blender with $99, it starts making me think that my money maybe could go on something that's gonna be a little bit more helpful and specific to my needs. But again, that's my needs. The other thing that concerns me slightly about this, and they are very clear about this here, is that this $99 is only paying for you to be able to have access to version one and all of the updates to version one. And with me wanting more tools than it's currently got, and I don't doubt that a lot of them will come in time, I'm just not sure how much I'm gonna be getting 
only having access to version 1 and not version 2 for that $99. For example, at the time of filming this, Plasticity has been out for about two and a half, three months, and it's already on version 1.2, meaning that this $99 might not last that long if you want to have the most up-to-date version of the piece of software. Now, I can't say what's going to happen with Plasticity in the future and what they're going to do with this charge, or maybe when it gets to the point where they're about to release version 2 and onwards, they might change their mind and give it to that indie license as well, but it's just something to be aware of when you purchase into this. So hopefully despite my obvious bias that's been a relatively informative and hopefully not too one-sided look at plasticity. As I say, it's my personal use, especially for 3D printing, that means this is not a piece of software that at the moment meets my needs. But if you've used plasticity and you find it really helpful, do say so in the comments and put some more positive things up about it. I love reading what people say, and I'm sure people that are watching this video would find it useful to have some comments from people that have used it for a bit longer. If you found the video useful, please do hit that like button, and if you're interested in more great 3D content, hit the subscribe button, and I hope you have a great day.